my name is Mariah and I'm the children's pastor here at a church called home. And I just wanna say thank you for joining us. We have a great service planned for you today. We truly believe God is going to speak to your heart wherever you're watching from. We're going to step into the worship part of the service just for a moment, and then we're gonna jump right into the message. Thank you again for joining us and welcome home. Wow, I am so grateful for our worship team and our production team. They always do a fantastic job. I wanted to add one more thing before we go to the message. We love hearing from you here at a church called home. We try to make it super easy to connect with us. If you text the words, welcome home to 94,000, you can share a testimony, send in a prayer request, see our upcoming events, you name it. It's available by texting welcome home to 94,000. If you are watching and you are in our area, we realize that before you visit in person, first you may visit online. 
We love our online services, but trust me, it's better in person. We've got a great message for you today. Go ahead and grab your Bible as we jump into God's Word. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to read to you a few verses of Scripture starting with verse 1. So if you have your Bible, open it up. If you have your Bible app, turn it on. And if you're watching online, thank you for being a part of our online family. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, the Bible says that Jesus climbed into a boat and he went across the lake to his own town. Some people brought him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to this paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Now, if you're like me and you don't mind to underline or mark or highlight in your Bible, why don't you do me a favor? Underline the words, my child. Or circle those two words, my child. Now, if you have a Bible app and your app will allow you to, why don't you highlight those two words? These guys bring their friend to Jesus. He's paralyzed. And what does he say? He says, be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus refers to this paralyzed man as his child. Now, I'm going to say something that is not politically correct, but it is biblically correct. When I read the Word of God, I realize that not everybody is a child of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are not born children of God. We're born children of wrath. That's Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are born sons and daughters of disobedience. That's the reason why you don't have to teach your children to do wrong. Wrong is in them. Anybody ever raised a youngin? I got a friend that says, I didn't believe there was a devil till I had children. I have two kids. My wife and I have two kids. They're, they're grown-ups now, about to be 24 and 26. When our daughter was between one and two years old, maybe she was two years old, I was at Walmart picking up something because my wife told me to. I don't remember why I was there, but I was there, and I had our daughter Tori in the buggy. Little did I know, while I was talking to somebody in the line behind us, our little toddler was stealing candy and sticking it into her onesie. Now, I could, have, I could have swore this child was from heaven. Right? That this child knew no wrong. But when I finished checking out and I went to pull her up out of that buggy, her onesie popped open and $400 of candy fell out of her onesie. <laughs> you don't have to teach a child to do wrong. Wrong is just in them. Wrong is in all of us. We're all broken. We're born broken. Sin is just a part of our spiritual DNA. You have to teach a child to do right. We're not born children of God. That's why Jesus said you have to be born what? Again. Jesus looked at the religious community that wanted to crucify Him. And He said, you are of your father, the devil. That's strong. So here's what I want to point out. This man that we're reading about, he said, you're my child. This man loved God. This man was a believer. This man was born again, so to speak. We know Jesus hadn't died for sin yet, but this man was a child of God. He loved God. Jesus said, be encouraged, my child, your sin is forgiven. Let's continue to read. Look at verse 3. But some of the teachers of the religious law, but some, you know there's always going to be some. There's always going to be somebody trying to hold you down, trying to pull you back. Always going to be somebody questioning your motives, questioning everything about you. Somebody said as long as gravity exists, there's always something trying to pull you down. The religious people said, that's blasphemy. How does he, Jesus, think he can forgive sin? Is, does he think that he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so He asked them, Why do you have such evil thoughts in your heart? Is it easier to say that your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up and walk? So that I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. He turned to that paralyzed man and He said, Stand up. Pick up that mat and go home. And immediately the man jumped up and he went home. 
Now, when I read this story some time back, um, my wheels started to turn. Here, here's, here's what I was thinking. Here you have some guys who have a friend who can't move. He can't walk. He's lame. He's paralyzed. So they take this man, put him on a mat, and they bring him to Jesus. And what does Jesus say to him? Be encouraged. You are my child. And your sins are forgiven. Let me ask you a question. Who said anything about sin? <laughs> Isn't that a funny thing to say to a man that has obviously been brought to you because he's lame and he can't walk? He's paralyzed. Who said anything about sin? Why not lead off with how long you've been in that condition? When's the last time you walked? Were you born this way? Do you want to be healed? I can move in your life. Be healed. Be whole. Stand up. Why lead off with be encouraged? You're my child and your sins are forgiven. I have a theory. Anybody want to hear my theory? Thank you, all five of you. The rest of you are going to get it for free anyway. Here's my theory. Here's my theory. Could it be that this man, that this man was rendered immobile by the shame of the sin of his past? Could it be that his past sin had immobilized him and he had become paralyzed by shame? Now, there's something you ought to know about me. I'm always trying. I take real serious the teaching and preaching of God's Word. It, I love it. I love sharing God's Word. I love God's Word, period. I love sharing God's Word with you. I hope you love receiving God's Word when I share it. I love His Word. That was a cue for you to say, Amen. But anyway, I'm going to keep going anyway. Thank you. It's too late. You done missed that opportunity. And I'm always working weeks in advance on messages and sermon series coming up. And I, and I always like to work a few weeks ahead of time. But this week, I, I drew a blank. And for the last couple weeks, I've been saying, Lord, Sunday's coming. Last week, I got a break and our youth pastor, Pastor Shy, preached. And I heard he killed it. Come on, man. I heard he just knocked it out of the park. I'm so proud of that guy. So proud of that guy. People got saved. Man, don't you like being at a church where people are coming to Christ? I love that. Happens all the time here. Love it. Never gets old. But I knew that, hey, I'm going to be on the platform today. And I really need to know what I'm going to preach. And I, I was blank. I was blank. And so uh, when I'm blank, I'm stressed. And so I came in here Monday and I was like, Lord, are you aware of the fact that in about seven days, I'm going to have to get on the platform. And I really just don't want to grab something from, from the air or, you know, I really just don't want to go back and repeat something or I don't want to go steal something from some other preacher. God, will you, what do you want me to say to your people? And so, believe it or not, I was praying for every person who is going to be in this service today. I prayed for every person watching today because here's what I know. Many of you I don't know because you're new. Many of you I do know because we've been doing life together for a while. And many of you right now online, you're, you're listening and you're on a treadmill. You're driving down I-40. Come on, let's just pray for everybody on the interstate right now. Because, man, I'm telling you, where the devil is right there on the interstate around Knoxville. Many of you, you're in your bed right now watching. You're on your couch watching. I was praying for every person under the sound of my voice this week. And I said, God, what do you want me to say to your people? And as soon as I prayed that prayer early Monday morning, this was the thought that went through my mind. I want you to talk to my people about overcoming shame. So for the next two weeks, I want to talk about no more shame. No more shame. Will you say that with me? No more shame. The truth is, shame is debilitating. Shame will paralyze you. And we all have this one thing in common. All of us, everyone under the sound of my voice, in this room, watching online, we all have this one thing in common. We've all done many things that we are ashamed of. All of us have done things that we hope no one ever finds out about. We've all had bad moral moments. But listen to me very carefully in the room and online. Listen to me. Despite your past and despite your present, God still loves you. Despite what you have done in the past, God still 
loves you. And God still wants you. And God still wants to do something in you. And God still wants to do something through you. And God still wants to do something around you. If you believe that, shout amen. There's two voices that you hear in this story. One's the voice of God, the voice of Jesus. The other voice that you hear in the story is the voice of the religious community. The religious community in this story questioned this man's salvation. That's what religion does. Religion is always do, and then do more, and then do more, and then do more. You earn your way in favor with God. That's what religion says. The good news is not you and your willpower. The gospel, which means good news, actually the word gospel means news that's too good to be true. That's what the word gospel means. The good news is not your effort. Josh, if you just try harder, you could quit drinking. Josh will tell you, if you've ever heard Josh preach, he talks about being bound by alcoholism. Well, the good news is not, Josh, if you would work harder, man. Josh, if you'd just put a little bit more effort. Josh, if you'd change the route you go home, you wouldn't be driving by those liquor stores and feeling pulled. I'm picking on Josh because we're friends and he knows I've got some past and God's still working on me. We're all a work in progress. The good news is not if you would work harder, if you would try harder. Nobody's going to get to heaven and say, look at what I did. Nobody's going to get to heaven and say, look at what me and Jesus did. When you go to heaven, you don't earn heaven, you enter heaven. And when you get to heaven, it's not like, look at what, I, I finally got it right. No, it's like, look at what Jesus did in my life. I was so messed up. I was so ashamed. I was so guilt stricken, but God saved me. No more. Religion says do, and when you've done, you... You keep doing, you keep doing. A religious mindset will keep you focused on your past and paralyzed in the present. I remember years ago, there was a guy that came to church for several years. And man, he was so talented and nobody knew the talent this guy possessed. He was an incredible musician. He was an incredible vocalist. This guy could sing. He was amazing. And I would say to him, listen man, what... When are you going to put what God gave you to use? When are you going to start serving at His pleasure? When are you going to take that gift God gave you and do something with it? And this is what He would tell me. He told me this for years. Man, I'm still trying to get some areas right. He's like, man, God's still working in some areas of my life. I'm still, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. And I would say, bro, I'm still a work in progress. If you're waiting for ministry... If you're, if you're waiting for personal perfection before ministry participation, you'll die not participating. But there, I love my wife, but there's a reason why we drive separate to church on Sunday. Because we've had our moments on the way to church in years past, and then I get on the platform, and I don't feel like I deserve to be on the platform. And everybody who's still a work in progress said, Amen. 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 I know, I know your spouse told me some things about you at some point. Over the years. Religion is always do and do more. A religious mindset will keep you focused on performance instead of the grace of God. So here's the end result of having a religious mindset. When it seems like you haven't done enough, because it's all about performance. When it seems as though you haven't done enough, you condemn yourself. And the moment it seems like you have, you start to condemn everybody else. Because religion equals condemnation. A religious mindset is all built around condemnation and shame. The grace of God is all built around what Christ bore. Listen, I never want what I once did to overshadow what Christ has done. Amen. The difference between Jesus and a religious mindset is a religious mindset condemns the best of us. Jesus saves the worst of us. Jesus says, you know what? 
Here's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation says, you're guilty. And it's never going to be any different. You, how many times are you going to come to God and ask for mercy? How many times are you going to come to God and repent and say, I'm sorry? How, I mean, shame on you. You're never going to be different. You're never going to get over this. You're never going to beat this. That's condemnation. You're guilty. There's no hope. Conviction is different. Conviction is you're guilty, but there's hope. And you can beat this. And because of the grace of God and the Holy Spirit that's alive in you now, you just watch. You just keep getting to Jesus. You just keep pressing in. You watch what God does in your life. Oh, I, I'm preaching. I'm preaching so good right now. I'm going to pat myself on the back. Now, here's how shame works. Shame works this way. You sin. You feel guilty. You get the yucks. There's that gnawing feeling in the pit of your stomach. You, you can't stand to be in a place where there's no noise. You get in a quiet place and you get uncomfortable. I remember a family member, dear, dear to my heart, when they were away from God, we, we had canceled cable and you know we, uh, we, we were cutting back and saving money everywhere we could save money at one point in our life. And we're still always trying to live within our means. You know what I'm saying? We're not being crazy or whatever. We, we'd cut our cable and we had a family member that came to see us, and I remember this family member saying, Man, I, I, am, I can't stand to be here another day. It's too quiet. And I said, That's because you're under conviction. That's because the Holy Spirit's after you. That's because Jesus is going, Come here, come here, come here. The good news is my family member got saved. Come on, somebody. But here, here's how it works you sin, you feel guilty, and then at that moment, you're either going to run to Jesus. Or away from Jesus. You're either going to run to God or away from God. Adam and Eve sinned. What they do? They sowed fig leaves. Adam said, somebody's got to wear the plants in his family. Right? <laughs> they sowed fig leaves. Like God, like God can't see through leaves. Like God can't see through a bush or a vegetation. What, you know what I'm saying? Somebody got to wear the plants in his family. And then they went and hid. They went in isolation. And so what does God do? God comes looking for them, not to condemn them, but to say, Come, Adam. Come, Eve. What have you done? And, and, and what do they do? I mean, they run in isolation. They start blaming. Adam blames Eve. Eve. Eve blames the devil. It's a blame game. And they are covered in shame. That's how it works. Here's how it's supposed to work. You sin. If you sin, and can I be honest... When you sin. Now I got saved when I was 19. Those of you who don't know, uh, I'm 28 now. <laughs> I got saved when I was 19. It was March 15th, 1992. That was 31 years ago. Now I would love to say to you, those of you who are wondering, I'm 50. You're welcome. I just did the math for you. Pay attention. Um, I would love to say that 31 years ago when I gave my heart to Jesus, I never sinned again. But the truth is, I'm not where I once was, but I'm still a work in progress. So if you sin, and when you sin, the way it's supposed to work is immediately you repent. And repentance isn't God, I made a mistake, because sin's not a mistake. A mistake is accidental. A mistake is when you pull into Food City parking lot, and you know the parking places are way too narrow, and you open your car door, and boom, you just ding somebody's door, which, by the way, drives me crazy. That's why I park way out there in the parking lot. Amen. Amen. Somebody enjoys their vehicle like I do mine. An accident is when you do something, you know, boom, you bump somebody's car. I didn't mean to do that. That's a mistake. Sin is not a mistake. Sin is a choice. And so what happens is if and when you sin, you immediately say, God, I messed up. I didn't make a mistake. God, I messed up. I made a choice. I, I let my temper get the best of me. My, my mouth got ahead of my mind, God. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. God, I messed up. And then what happens is there's freedom. There's therefore no 
condemnation. Now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Are you still with me? Yeah. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If you confess your sin to Him, He's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. No more shame. There's freedom. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, I write these things to you that you might not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You know what the word advocate means? It means a cover. Somebody shared it with me like this one time. They said, whatever you uncover, Jesus will cover. But whatever you cover, He's going to one day uncover it. So the way it's supposed to work, if I mess up, I immediately repent. God, I'm sorry. I I know I shouldn't have done it. I messed up. And there's freedom. Whatever you uncover, what? Jesus will. Now here's why I share this with you. Some of you may have heard parts of this story. But when I was 17, see I had a BC day, a before Christ day. Uh, first time I was exposed to pornography, I was a, I was a young, young kid. Um, drugs, alcohol, I mean you name it. I was, I was so lost when I was 17. I, I was miserable. My parents know a portion of the things I've done. My wife knows a little more of what I've done. My kids know a fraction of what I've done. But when I was 17, I was was so under conviction. I was so miserable. Because sin is fun for a season. If you don't have fun sinning, you're not doing it the right way. I mean, it's fun for a while. And, And the fun had ran out. And I was miserable. So at age 17, here's what I did. I went to this church on a Wednesday night. I got in my Sunday best. I dressed up good because that's what you do. You dress up and go to God, right? No, you just go to God, right? But I got on my Sunday best. I went to a church. I don't know what they sang. I don't know what the guy preached. But he gave an invitation at the end of the service. said, if you need Jesus, if if you're away from God, come. I went up and I prayed. And I'm telling you, when I say I prayed, I snotted on that altar. I'm talking, I wet that altar with my tears. Nobody prayed with me. Nobody came to talk to me. Nothing. Here's what I said to God. I said, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm broken. I know I've sinned. I'm so sorry. And then I said these words. I said, I'll never sin again. If you'll forgive me, I'll never sin again. You know why we have prayer counselors at the end of our service up here? Because if you have questions, they're here to answer questions. If you want somebody to pray with you, we want people here ready to pray with you. The reason why in the last couple years we've given over a thousand making a new start devotions out there in that cafe is we want to answer questions about the faith. We believe God's wanting to do something beautiful in your life. And we know there's a devil that will lie to you. And there's religious people who will lie to you. Jesus doesn't point His finger this way. He points His finger this way. And so at age 17, I prayed. I said, God, if you'll forgive me, I'll never sin again. The next day, I was neck deep in sin. And then this is what happened. For two years, no embellishment. I'm not exaggerating this. For two years, I never looked myself in the eye in the mirror. I would look in the mirror when I'd get ready. Look in the mirror when I fix my hair. I look in the mirror after I brush my teeth and make sure I had no toothpaste on my mouth. But for two years, I would not look myself in the eye in the mirror because I hated what looked at me. And I would have killed myself had I not been afraid of what eternity would look like for me. I hated, I hated. What I was looking at. I had so much shame. For two years, for two years, I would not look in the direction of a church. And and when you grow up in southeastern Kentucky in the mountains, there's a church every quarter of a mile. So I would drive down the road like this. Like God didn't know. But I thought God was chasing me because He was mad at me. Then my mom, when I was 19, she went to this life-giving church. 
that love Jesus and love people and preach the good news. And I went and I saw joy on people. I saw the presence of God settling on people. People had something I didn't have and the preacher wasn't doing this. The preacher was saying, if you're broken, God loves you. If you need Jesus, God can help you. And I went forward and my life has never been the same. Never been the same. Look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 11. Anyone who believes in Christ will never be put, what? To shame. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more. Look at Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our sin and our transgression from us. Look at Isaiah 54 4. I'm getting cranked up. I feel like preaching today. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer no more shame. No more shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget. You will forget the shame of your youth. For ten years after I gave my heart to Jesus... I would have maybe every other month, maybe once a quarter, maybe every six months, I would have a dream. And I would dream about the things that I was doing before I gave my heart to Christ. And I would wake up feeling so bad again. And it was as if the Holy Spirit was allowing me to, for a moment, remember where God brought me from. Oh, can I tell you, it's been about 20 years since I had one of those dreams. I can't, I see things and I think, man, I can't, I can't believe where God has brought me from. Man, if you've been saved, if you've been born again, if God's done something in your life, won't you give God praise right now? Man. Man. I want to point out one last thing that we see in this story. In Matthew chapter 9. One last thing. I want you to notice in the story that not only did Jesus forgive the man, and not only did Jesus reassure the man that he had been forgiven, not only did he reassure him that he was his child, I want you to notice that he also set him free from his old way of living. In other words, he didn't leave him on the mat. And here's what that means for you and I. God loves you where you are. And God will come to where you are. And God will save you where you are. He will receive you where you are. And listen to me carefully. He will receive you as you are. But He loves you too much to leave you where you are. I'm so grateful. 31 years ago, he reached down. He had to reach low to get me. I'm so grateful that he reached all the way down there. But you know what I'm also grateful for? I'm grateful for the fact I'm not there anymore. I'm not there anymore. I'm not there anymore. Listen, I'm still a work in progress. You can catch me on a bad day. You can catch me on a bad day and say, Preacher, you need to, you need to pray. But if you had known me back then, God has done a work in my life. Listen to me carefully. I I really want you to get a hold of what I'm saying. And especially you watching today online. And anybody who's new in the house, listen to what I'm saying. Because this is the heartbeat of, this is why we call this place a church called home. If you're within driving distance of this church and you're broken, we want you here. If you're an alcoholic, We want you here. If you're an addict, we want you here. I remember a few years ago, we would have to have ushers help a man down the hallway to find a chair. He would come every week so blasted drunk. He couldn't stand up. They would, he would bounce off the wall. They would have to help him come in. That was a win for me. That was a win for me. That, I celebrate that right there. There should never be more love in a club on Saturday night than there is at a church on Sunday morning. 
Listen to me very carefully. If you're a homosexual and you're within driving distance, we want you here. God loves you where you are. God will receive you where you are, just as you are. But listen to me carefully. He loves you too much to leave you where you are. Now, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal, church called home. Our job is not to fix people. Think about the friends that this man had in this story. In the story, you don't read them saying, What's wrong with you, Bubba? How long are you going to lay on that mat, Bubba? When are you going to get up off that mat, Bubba, and walk? What's your problem, Bubba? You need to... Boy, get, get up. No, no, no. They couldn't fix him. You know what? In case you're wondering what kind of church this is, this is a church... That is on a desperate mission to get people to Jesus. I can't fix people. I've been working for a long time on fixing me and I realize I can't fix me. And all the wives who's tried to fix their husband, come on, say, I can't fix him. It's a lost cause. I can't fix him. We can't fix nobody. Our job, we are not in the business of fixing people. We're like the guys in Matthew 9 who's got a friend who says, You know what? I'm broken, man. I I need God. I need help. I can't fix you, Bubba, but Bubba, I can take you to Jesus. And Jesus can do something. Jesus can move. Jesus can redeem. Jesus can restore. Jesus can give you your dignity back. Jesus can get you up and moving again. Oh, my Lord. Well, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I love you. I love you. God loves you. We preach Jesus. We love people. And we're just trying to get people to Jesus. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. If today you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're away from God, I'd love to pray for you right now. And it's as easy as opening up your heart and saying, God, I need you in my life. At a church called home, we call it making a new start. That's what happens when you say yes to Jesus. So come on, if that's you, why don't you just pray with me? Go ahead and bow your head and let's pray together. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I'm inviting you into my life. Forgive me of every wrong I've ever done. I need your mercy. I need your grace. Today, I'm making a new start. In Jesus' name, Thank you for saving me. Amen. Hey, you know what? I believe when the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. I believe the Bible means that. So I want to ask you to do me a favor. If if today you prayed that prayer, would you text the words, Welcome Home to 94,000? And you can check that you gave your heart to Christ. And I'd love to send you one of my latest books. It's called Making a New Start. And it will be a blessing to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Can't wait to see you next week. God bless and welcome home.